Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here to tell you guys about some work we've been doing in my lab to understand how genes are regulated in 3D structures that form between distal enhancers and promoters. And I wanted to start with some pictures that are a little bit more elaborate than usual line with blobs on it. Um, these are from some colleagues who've attempted to make videos or, or still graphics of the process of transcription. And the purpose is to remind all of us that this is happening in a three-dimensional space, that it involves a lot of proteins and it involves DNA and chromatin forming complex structures. And I would argue that while more complicated than the line drawings, these are still falling short of the true complexity. So our goal was to try to understand um, <clears throat> what we could about this process from ENCODE-like data, including actual ENCODE data. So, um, the motivation um, is, is probably clear. This has been spoken about already by Mathieu this morning and Tyler last night. Um, but just to recap and to maybe give you a little personal look into my motivation, um, the idea is that um, there are many mutations in the non-coding portion of the genome. It's an obvious hypothesis that these might affect enhancers, as we've also heard about today um, in several other talks. Um, and so if you uh, have here in the line drawing version a mutation that's associated with a disease, for instance, or um, something I'm really interested in, um, which is um, a human chimp difference, a divergence between us and our closely related relatives, you might want to ask, could this variant actually be causal? And, or is it some other linked variant nearby? And if I could find the causal variant, how would I follow that up? I would want to know the genes and the pathways that were being targeted. Um, and so it would be um, complicated if there were many genes in this locus, which there are um, in most places in the genome where we look at these non-coding mutations. So what we've been working on um, a lot in my lab, and we came to it from this evolutionary question of comparing humans and chimps, and by our observation that the fastest evolving regions of the human genome have the genetic and epigenetic signatures of, of distal enhancers that function during development. Um, but I think is also very relevant to the disease question. We've been asking ourselves, can we annotate where the enhancers are, where the distal regulatory elements are? And I know many people here have been thinking about that. And then more recently, it would be great, we've been thinking that it would be great if we could map those to the genes. For example, um, here, if that TC variant on the right looks interesting because it falls in an, in an enhancer in a relevant cell type, um, the inference that it would be regulating the closest gene, gene C, is wrong in this map where it's actually looping over here to regulate gene A. So these problems are both hard, as everybody here knows. Finding enhancers um, and figuring out what genes they target are not easy problems. Some of the Standard things that are done, such as performing a few CHIP-seq experiments and saying, oh, I found enhancers, these are K27 acetylated, for example, um, failed to identify many of the experimentally validated enhancers and find many false positives. But there is helpful information there, and the idea would be if we can combine lots of data sets together to do better. And our hope was that we might be able to improve on predicting gene targets because the commonly used practice of picking the closest gene or even picking all genes within a reasonable window on the genome. Turns out when you do the chromatin capture experiment that measures these interactions to be right only like 8 to 10 percent of the time. Um, so often we're, when we do a gene ontology enrichment or some sort of follow-up functional study, we're actually pursuing the wrong functions and the wrong genes and the wrong pathway. So I'm going to focus, I'm going to assume initially that we know the enhancers. And I'm going to focus on the question of predicting the gene targets. So the question is, can we reconstruct 3D interactions between enhancers and promoters from the 2D genomic data? Um, and so here's a picture of a region of the human genome, just to define the complexity of the problem a little more and to show you some of the data. This is a browser-like shot. There are many genes here. These are active enhancers and active promoters, um, in this case from Chrome HMM. And uh, these are interactions that were detected in a high-resolution, high-C experiment where chromatin capture measured um, that some of these enhancers here, this one, E1 and E2, are looping over to this promoter, not these intervening genes here. So could 
we predict this from all this up here. And why might we want to do that has been motivated um, by several other speakers here, but um, one huge motivation is that this experiment to get it to this resolution of single promoters and single enhancers is incredibly expensive, millions of dollars to generate that data. And this data is easier to generate in a short time period and with less money. Another motivation that I think is maybe even more exciting in some sense than the financial motivation is that if some of this data were predictive, we might actually learn something about how chromatin loops form. That we might learn something about the mechanism. So the approach that we've been using is supervised machine learning. What that means is that we need training data. We need some examples of promoters and enhancers that are active in a cell type and are in physical proximity to each other. And some other enhancers and promoters that are active have the active marks at them but are not physically interacting. And then we have uh, feature data from which we are going to try to learn a model. And once we learn a model, by holding out some of the data, we can evaluate how well we predict on that held out data, a process called cross-validation. If we could succeed in this, we could then make predictions beyond our training data um, with some confidence in the accuracy. So we're um, fortunate to have some good training data here. Uh, this publication that came out at the very end of 2014 performed, as I mentioned, um, high C experiment, the chromatin capture at one kilobase resolution in several of the ENCODE cell lines. This is genome-wide and um, gives us the resolution that we need to see individual promoters interacting with individual enhancers, um, but exceedingly expensive to generate millions of dollars. So by looking at it, active enhancers and active promoters and labeling them as positives if they are interacting in the high C and negatives if they're not, we have a training data set. The features we used to try to predict the interactions were of three general types. One, we looked at evolutionary conservation, not of the sequence per se, but of the um, co-localization or the syntony of the enhancer and the promoter. So if we look across evolutionary time, is there a conserved sequence for that enhancer across species and does it stay relatively close or at a similar distance to that gene? This had been shown to be very predictive of eQTLs, expression Q quantitative trait loci. Um, it turned out not to be particularly predictive in this, um, it, for us on this problem. Um, most of the data we used and most of what was very predictive were functional genomics experiments, primarily ChIP-seq for transcription factors, histone modifications, and various um, structural proteins. The key, um, and I'll jump a little bit ahead, and I will tell you more about this in a minute, is um, what we did was we looked at the enhancer and the promoter, which others have done. We heard about that from Mathieu this morning. The really interesting thing where we learned some really interesting biology and we really improved our predictions was to look at the window in between the enhancer and promoter to integrate the signal along that piece of looping chromatin. Um, and this is, is different than what I've seen others do before. We tried it, frankly, on a bit of a whim and it turned out to be a really interesting and important thing to have done. Finally, we looked at the sequences themselves, so looking at the upstream transcription factors that are predicted by motif analysis to bind the enhancer are those annotated to be involved in similar functions as a potential target gene, um, and also are there shared motifs at the enhancer and promoter. Um, there was also some evidence um, from others that these would be useful features. There was some information there, but um, most of the data turned out to be in these um, ChIP-seq experiments, as I'll show you in a minute and specifically on the looping chromatin more than at the enhancer and promoter. For those that are interested, I'll tell you about the computational algorithm. We decided to use decision trees. The motivation was that um, we thought that these features might interact in complex combinations, which turned out to be true. So you might want some event to happen or another event, but not some third event. And, and we knew that um, it wasn't from the, the browser shot I showed previously, uh, we knew this was going to be complex and that we needed to be able to model these, these Boolean combinations and that decision trees might be a good way to do this. Um, and by decision trees, um, I mean approaches such as random forests and gradient boosting. We tried several different algorithms and within this sort of family of ensemble um, methods, there wasn't a big difference in performance across algorithms. So uh, um, 
we did get a lot of benefit, however, from this ensemble approach, which is essentially that you build many imperfect classifiers by random permutations of your data and then combine them to get a predictor that does better than your single best predictor would. This is really important um, because essentially what you do is you overfit some little part of your data through that random subsampling. And by sort of learning these different subsets of features that can sometimes but not always be important, you actually learn a more thorough model um, than if you just took your best classifier on the full data set. Um, this gave us a real boost in performance. So um, the results of doing this really surprised me. I knew this was a hard problem and I knew there'd be some information here. I didn't expect to see um, such good performance, but here's a, a summary of what we found. And so this is on three ENCODE cell lines where we had a lot of data to mine for features and we had the high resolution high C um, from the experiments done at the end of last year at the Broad. So, um, these pictures are probably familiar to everyone. This is the false positive rate. This is the true positive rate on the vertical axis. Perfect performance would be in the upper left-hand corner. By having uh, our algorithm outputs a score, and by thresholding that score, you can have a curve here where you make many predictions, have a high false positive rate, but also get all of your predictions, or down here, um, less power, finding less of your true positives, but also a much lower false positive rate, so a stricter predictor. And what you can see is what we do a great job um, by a number of different measures. The area under this curve is one measure of performance. I think it's very important in bioinformatics problems where most of your data set are false positives to not just report an AUC, um, which is the area under this curve, which is how high above the random guessing line I am, but to also look at precision and recall because um, in a set, a problem where most of the genome or most of the enhancer promoter pairs are not physically interacting, a predictor that doesn't, um, that predicts no interaction most of the time would just randomly have a very uh, low false positive rate, but you um, wouldn't have very good precision. Most of your predictions would be wrong. So um, pleasingly, we also had a very high precision, which I was very surprised to see. So when Sean Whelan, the postdoc in my lab, showed this to me, I thought, well, maybe the, we just um, encoded, then maybe this is a mistake. It can't be true. So first of all, was there any bleeding between your cross-validation sets, a bunch of technical issues? We resolved that none of those were going on. And then I said, well, maybe these features are just encoding how far away the enhancer is from the promoter because we know at least at very short ranges, like 10 to 20 kilobases away, there is a higher chance that an enhancer is interacting with a promoter. So we looked. And it turns out there's no dependence on performance based on distance between the promoter and enhancer. And if anything, we do a little bit better the further away the enhancer is from the promoter. Um, despite the fact that many of these are uh, millions, up to two million base pairs away from the promoter that they, in, they regulate. So it wasn't just, we weren't encoding distance here with this complex feature set. So what, what was encoded in the feature set? As I alluded to earlier, it turned out it was really important to look at the window between the enhancer and the promoter. What proteins are decorating that looping chromatin? So um, we looked, um, a nice aspect of using uh, ensemble methods is that there are now some very nice techniques for feature importance. In other words, how important was each of the very different data sets for the prediction accuracy? Using techniques such as run, uh, uh, recursive feature elimination, for example. So you can get a measure of the importance of a feature. And here I'm making box plots where I'm showing the distribution in different cell lines uh, plus a combined model in the four colors for the enhancer, the window in between, and the promoter. So uh, marks at the promoter, the window are in the enhancer, how predictive are they on the vertical axis? And what you see is that there's signal in all three regions. Uh, the promoter has a bit more information than the enhancer, but the window in between is actually where the most information was, the most predictive information. So then I thought, well, maybe this was because there were just more proteins binding, binding there, more signal. But actually, the, this, is, this more predictive accuracy is despite the fact that the signal, which I'm just plotting here, is the sort of density of peaks, is actually lower on the looping chromatin. So there's not a lot going on there, but what is going on there is super important. So what is it? What's, what's binding there, but not binding there? What's happening to the DNA? 
Um, as I alluded to, this is a complicated mixture of things. There's not a simple signature, but it's a very um, consistent story when we look at the, the sorts of things. So if an enhancer and a promoter are looping with each other and we look not just adjacent to the promoter and the enhancer, but on the intervening window, we see other enhancers. This makes sense in the sense of super enhancers or because we know that enhancers tend to cluster together. So not right next to you, but nearby the enhancer are often other enhancers. So this is a very active region. But, and we might have expected that, but what I wasn't necessarily expecting was that the loop has a lot of marks, epigenetic and, and a DNA methylation, et cetera, marks of heterochromatin. So this is, first of all, telling you that maybe an intervening gene is not the target of that enhancer, that it's repressed. But in some cases, there are actually little windows that aren't heterochromatinized that have active genes in them. But in between is this heterochromatin. So there may actually be something physical or structural going on where it's helpful to compact the chromatin and bring the enhancer and promoter closer together. Um, the, the biophysical modeling literature has some sort of spring models and some other theories about heterochromatin and it, how it helps these sorts of interactions um, that we've been reading about. So finally, um, I said there were some active promoters or some quote active promoters in the window, but frequently they're kind of false signals because what we actually see when we look at the gene bodies of those genes is it seems like the polymerase, while loaded up at the promoters, is not actively elongating and making transcript. Um, now what about the false interactions, the cases where a promoter and enhancer don't interact? The window in between often has the cohesin complex on it, including this zinc finger 143 that we heard about from Mathieu this morning, suggesting that there is a, a, a chromatin loop and a pinching off with the cohesin complex, a real chromatin interaction, but it's with an intervening promoter, not the one that you're considering. And there is some evidence that these loops um, are actually, uh, can act as insulators as well. So it's giving information that there may be a different target gene and also may actually be a physical structure that prevents looping to a, 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 um, a promoter further downstream. And then mirroring what we saw, we saw marks of open chromatin and elongation, um, active promoters and active gene bodies. Importantly, the meaning of these different features was different if we saw it at a promoter or an enhancer or in the window. So this cohesin complex that is a negative predictor of an interaction when it occurs in the window is actually a positive predictor of an interaction if it's near, the, if it's flanking the enhancer and promoter, as we heard from Mathieu this morning. So it's important to actually split up the feature in terms of these different regions and to keep in mind that a protein can serve a different function depending on where you see it physically along the DNA. We saw this not just for cohesin, but a number of other proteins too. So, um, what we started to see, and cohesin is an example of this, is that there seemed to be complexes that were forming on this looping chromatin, that we would see several factors co-occurring or being co-predictive. So we actually just looked genome-wide and looked at the co-location. We made a map of the co-location of the predictive features. So here are some of the top features for the K562 cell line, and if there's a dark color in this heat map, it means that they actually, on this looping chromatin, occur at flanking or overlapping positions. Um, and so here's the cohesin complex, and, and those proteins are co-localized, co as you would expect. But it's not just known complexes. When we form a network out of these co-localizations, we see some interactions or co-occurrences of different features that weren't previously known. So in orange is our co-localization data, purple are known protein-protein interactions. And so this suggests some inter potentially cooperative or interacting roles of some of these different features that could be tested. Um, and certainly from the perspective of prediction, we need many of these variables in the model. No one of them alone is predictive. We need the combination of something co-occurring or not co-occurring with something else. So the big question for us and various collaborators, um, and certainly for studying human accelerated regions and their role in human development, would be can we do this outside of the ENCODE cell lines? Could we do this without the rich feature set? Because we put hundreds and hundreds of data sets into the machine learning algorithm, and could we have done that with less data sets? 
So first, we assumed that we still had some good training examples, some validated interactions and non-interactions to train and just asked, well, what if ENCODE had only chipped five transcription factors or 10 or 15 or 20? How does the prediction accuracy affect it? So what's a minimal set of experiments? And pleasingly, we found that performance was very flat down to as few as 16 data sets, totally flat and still near optimal with as few as eight data sets. So you can't just use one or two features. As I mentioned, it's a complex combination of things going on. And if you look across examples in the genome, okay, many of them have, say, the cohesin complex, the non-interactions, many of them have cohesin on the looping chromatin, but not all of them. But the ones that don't might have some other feature, a different uh, epigenetic mark. And so you, you need a several of these features, and it's not a random eight, but there are a good number of different sets of eight that give near optimal performance. They are not the same features you would use for predicting promoters and enhancers, however, in most cases. They're slightly different ones. Um, but this does give um, some hope for moving into other cell lines that you wouldn't need the time and budget and team of an ENCODE project. Now, what if I didn't have that high resolution high C produced at the broad for millions of dollars? So I know here that I can get away with fewer features. Could I get away with less or no training data? So the worst case scenario would be no training data. Let's say that I built the model on an ENCODE cell line and then I plugged in the chip seek from my cardiomyocytes. Can I make predictions? Is the, are the, is the model the same across different cell types? So we tested that amongst the ENCODE cell lines, which are from different, totally different lineages, and so sort of a worst case scenario, to see if a model trained on one cell line could predict on another. And we heard a little bit along these lines um, from Tyler last night. He also went across species. So this is a measure F max of predictive accuracy. It's the harmonic mean of precision and recall. And I already told you these numbers where we had good balance of precision and recall when you train and test on the same, on data held out from the same cell line. And you can see performance does degrade when you go to a different cell line. So it's very helpful to have some training examples. It doesn't need to be genome-wide, high resolution, high C, need, but some good unbiased training examples in your given cell type. And we're testing now if some Chia pet, for example, might achieve this, which would be a less expensive experiment. But there, it's, this is not horrible. This is still decent. So we basically expect about 35% precision and 55% recall on a new cell line with only 10 ChIP-seq data sets and no training data. So that's kind of a worst case scenario. We think if you use a more closely related cell line that it will be better than this and that if you have a little bit of training data or a few more features, you can improve. So I thought this was, was a good place to start from. So to summarize uh, this target finder project, our problem was to predict these interactions from things that are marking the DNA. It improves significantly upon using the closest gene, which is frequently wrong and, and makes many false positive predictions. The summary of our performance is that we can get more than 90% of known pairs at a low false positive rate and that if, if you did this on a different cell line with less data, it could be maybe as bad as 55%. So it's a worst case scenario with very little data. Um, and the great thing, uh, the most important thing probably is that the false positive rate is really low. So our precision was high, our false discovery rate was very low. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to mention how do you find the enhancers? Because um, we've also worked, used machine learning to work on this problem. Um, it's published work and so I'll just briefly summarize it. Um, but some of these same uh, machine learning techniques have been helpful there. So which sequences function as these long-range enhancers? We've been particularly interested in development um, because the uh, bioinformatics tell us that many of the human accelerated regions function in development. Um, and we also have a number of collaborations in heart and brain development at the Gladstone Institutes where I work. Um, the other reason to think about development is there are many validated examples of enhancers, for example, from the Vista browser, and we'll hear from Len Pinocchio about that, uh, I believe, in his talk tomorrow. So these are uh, pictures of mouse embryos where a candidate enhancer has been um, <coughs> transiently transfected into the single cell embryo. 
and um, you can see staining in the tissues and at the time points during development when that enhancer functions. It turns on a reporter gene or it doesn't. It was tested and there was no reporter gene expression. Um, and so this is a great um, proving ground then, or a good training data, I should say, for doing a uh, supervised learning. So we again use genomic features, evolutionary conservation, in this case of the sequence itself, functional genomics data, again, at the potential enhancer location, and sequence motifs of known binding sites or position-specific weight matrix predicted binding sites, as well as just enumerating all KMERS that, um, uh, as a way to get at uh, binding sites for transcription factors that don't have a good motif model. Um, all, in this case, all three types of data were predictive. They did not predict overlapping sets. I mean, they predict partially overlapping sets of enhancers, but each predicted some enhancers that the other one did not. Um, and so it was helpful to combine them in a model. Um, and the model that included all three types of data was the best performing by far. Um, so this was a little different from the chromatin looping predictions where we really got most of our power from the functional genomics data. Here, um, we used a support vector machine, something called a variant of it called multi-kernel learning, which allows you to build a separate kernel or predictor for each type of data and then do a linear combination, a weighted combination of those for the overall predictor. This was helpful because we knew we needed all three types and they're not on the same scale. They're very different types of data and so um, it can be hard to put them into a model together on a comparable or regularized scale. Um, but uh, I think there, there may be room for improvement um, trying other algorithms here. Um, we didn't do a lot of experimenting with different algorithms. Um, so briefly to summarize, here's our performance. Um, again, we saw a very pleasing area under this curve, um, a high power at a fairly low false positive rate. Um, and importantly, this significantly improves upon using a few different ChIP-seq data sets. So in red, blue, and green are some of the typical enhancer marks, K4 monomethylation the, and K27 acetylation, as well as binding of the transcriptional coactivator P300. Um, each of those by itself um, is somewhat predictive. Uh, if we combine them and we get the union of all of them, we get a pretty high power but an exceedingly high false positive rate. So there was room for improving upon just doing some intersections and unions of data sets. Um, and we think that this is essentially the benefit of having some training data and using a uh, machine learning framework is that you can improve upon the, the sort of simple bioinformatic combinations. Here, the false discovery rate wasn't quite as awesome as uh, in the looping, which is interesting because I actually thought this was an easier problem. Um, but, um, but still, we had um, a pretty good recall at a, at a, a pretty high precision. So um, <clears throat> we made predictions across the human genome. This is for all of development, any tissue, about 84,000 predictions. They had many of the bioinformatic features of enhancers. Important to me, we predicted kind of conservatively that about a third of human accelerated regions were active during development. I'm not going to show you the results, but we did some of those mouse experiments ourselves and, and 25 out of the 30 that we tested at just one developmental stage, embryonic day 11.5, were active enhancers in vivo and we think so now that several others are active at other later time points. Um, and another sort of piece of data supporting these predictions was work from Adam Siepel's lab looking at fitness effects of um, the positions across the uh, human genome, the FitCon scores. Um, and even though they were looking in ENCODE cell lines, these were developmental, it was, tra was trained on, it, on embryos. Um, I was really surprised to see that, that we were actually doing almost as well as their method at predicting these sites with fitness effects. I, I don't understand exactly why because it's totally different cell types, but I thought that was interesting. So to conclude, uh, just where we're going from here, these mouse experiments are expensive. They're low throughput. We can just test one enhancer at a time, but as many of you might be aware, this experiment can now be done in a high throughput manner by taking this vector and putting a barcode downstream, or actually putting the enhancer itself downstream is another variant. And that way, for every enhancer that you're testing, you have a transcribed sequence that tells you that that enhancer is working. 
And therefore, you can assay the activity of many different enhancers by RNA-seq. And it's possible now to synthesize thousands of these, um, clone them, and then in cell lines, at least, to do uh, in parallel in the same cells, look at these thousands of, screen thousands of enhancers and specific mutations in enhancers in parallel. And we are doing this in cell lines that are derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, my office is right next to Shinya Yamanaka, who's been referenced several times today. I feel really honored to work with him and Bruce Conklin and others at Gladstone who are real whizzes at reprogramming cells and then differentiating them into different cells like neurons and here um, beating heart cells in the dish um, that have a lot of the characteristics of the original tissues. And this is fantastic, especially for human chimp comparisons, because we can never get the tissues and cell lines to do direct comparisons with, a, with an ape um, for various ethical reasons, even if we were able to obtain, say, human embryos. Um, but in, here we avoid those issues completely by reprogramming skin cells and getting these various developmental cell types. So here's our approach, this computational things I've talked about today, the screening in IPS, and then we have to still go back to animal models for real functional studies. I'll end there, thank our collaborators, especially Sean Wantlin, who led the work on Target Finder and our funding sources, and I'm happy to take questions. Hi. Um, do you think with the looping uh, studies that the syntony would have been more predictive if you'd used um, species further apart? We looked across all of mammalian evolution. Um, if you go much further out, there are very few of the enhancers are conserved, and so it becomes really difficult to do that. Um, so we looked about as far as we could in terms of being able to find a homologous promoter and an enhancer. There was some signal there, but not as much as we had thought there would and be. And was the signal that was actually there, were those mostly um, developmental genes? Um, or, or yes, you know? actually, there is more conserved syntony and developmental loci, yeah. Great talk. Um, Thank you. Can you tell me anything about the resolution you end up with, with your prediction for the high C? Because for the high C, it's like 1 KB, 4 KB, and there's often multiple enhancers, DHS sites. These are sites. the resolution of a single promoter and a single enhancer, single so enhancer. a KB or less. So you're able, you're able to parse out within a given block called by high C those that are most likely to be Yes, wow. that's precisely it. Yeah, we can wow. get below, like a regular high C experiment might be like 25 KB. We can, by using the chip seek yeah. peaks, we can resolve it down to a single promoter and enhancer Beautiful. in silico. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on um, how well your enhancer finder works in terms of enhancers being accumulated in a tissue or cell-specific fashion? Yeah, how cell type specific is it? So we tried, um, besides just predicting any tissue in the developing embryo, we tried to then go on and predict the tissue. And that's a harder problem. Um, the AUC is more like 60, 70 percent. It depends on the tissue. So heart enhancers were very easy to predict. They had a specific GC content and a low evolutionary conservation interestingly, and some very specific motifs. Some of the other tissues, like limb or brain, were a bit harder. Um, and uh, I think partially that's because we didn't have quite the right chip-seq data. I should have emphasized we're predicting in the developing embryo, and we're using ENCODE and epigenetic roadmap and about everything we could get our hands on, basically everything that's ever been deposited, um, very little of which is from a developmental cell type. So we looked um, at heart development because we do have collaborators who are studying differentiation into cardiomyocytes. And improved prediction did improve a little bit at getting specifically the heart, embryonic heart, by putting in the data sets from the IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. But it didn't, um, it still wasn't quite as good as just the overall, okay, it's a developmental enhancer. So I think there's some room to still improve on tissue specificity. That was a great talk. Thank I have you. A, a question about the target finder. Yes. Could you talk about um, what kind of cross validation you did? Yeah, cross validation was incredibly important because um, we wouldn't want to overfit um, and we needed um, some measure of performance. And so we, um, we tried a number of things, but the results I wish the AUC curves and the precision and recall values I was reporting 
were from tenfold cross-validation, um, repeated. Um, so it's ensemble learning, so it's within each step in the random forest we're performing that, so it's very computationally intensive, but that makes sure that there's no bleeding from the training data into the test data. It's very important that you do that right, that you aren't within your ensemble having a feature sometimes on the training side and sometimes on the test side that can give a very uh, rosy but inaccurate measure of performance. So um, yeah, those were the cross-validation error rates. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Yeah, so maybe lunchtime. <laughs>